two minutes. We are excited to worship with all of you. Head on in and grab a seat. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Good morning, everybody. Why don't you stand to your feet? We are going to sing. Great to see you. Welcome to Southlands. Good to see you if you're online too. Thanks for joining us. Let's worship.
wisdom. offer up our praises. We want to sing our songs to you, King Jesus, the one who deserves all praise, all glory, all honour. Come we be worship this morning, King Jesus.
you, King Jesus. We want to receive from you today. We thank you, God, that you are present with your people. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to those that are online. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Southlands, and we're going to continue in our time of worship, and we're going to do a bit of a celebration through baptism. Yeah. Woo! All right, I'm going to welcome up Zoe Lima. Baptism is just uh, an outward expression of an inward commitment, and baptism is also a sign of um, and a picture of Jesus' life as the individual stands there and, and death as they enter into the water and Jesus being raised from the grave of taking part in that. So, Zoe, why don't you step in? Yeah, Zoe. Woo! Zoe, do you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you commit to following him all the days of your life? Yes. With that confession of faith, me and your Father baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Family and friends, you're free to come over and pray for Zoe as we continue in worship. I worship you. I worship you. 
are the way maker. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are the way maker. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Come on, let's worship Him together. You are. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are, you are. We make miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. struggling to see it today or feel it that he is working there's the discipline of faith to say that is who you are regardless of my circumstance today I believe that you make a way Jesus I believe that you're working in every season we believe that you are the king we believe that you are alive. We believe that you have glory and power to heal and save and work. Jesus, that is who you are. Let's sing. That is who you are. 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 That is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. 
Yeah, Jesus, we we this morning are just so grateful that you are who you say you are. And Jesus, so often our hearts feel fickle and some days we feel like we love you so well and so much and other days we feel like we just, we don't feel it, we don't see it. But Jesus, we rejoice in the fact that we cling not to our own hearts, but we cling to the fact that you are who you say you are. And so this morning, God, we wanna rejoice and we wanna worship you. We celebrate Zoe being baptized. God, these incredible moments, God, where you are moving, where you are working, God. And Jesus, this morning, I just wanna pray as we land worship that regardless of how we've entered this morning, whether we've entered this morning full of faith for what you might do, or we enter this morning just saying, I'm here, but I don't feel it. I don't see it. Jesus, I pray it this morning as we sit in, in this gathered body that we would be reminded of the fact that you are who you say you are, that you are faithful, that you are true, that you keep your promises. And that's what we take incredible comfort in God is that you are who you say you are this morning. You are who you say you are tomorrow and the next day. Lord, you are the unchanging one that we cling to with all that we have. And so this morning, Jesus, as we gather, as we're here, as we hear your word preached, God, we wanna be reminded of that. And we wanna pray that you would break in and interrupt some of us this morning. And even if we're not feeling it, that we know and that we would see and that we would experience that you are at work in this place, God. We love you, we praise you, amen. amen. Southlands, it has been so, so good to worship with you. Uh, we're going to land worship. Uh, we have a full morning with lots of exciting stuff going on. Can I say, I know we have a good amount of visitors who are here connected to Camp Agape. If you are here connected to Camp Agape, can you just raise your hands real high? And if you're here and you're going, I have no idea what Camp Agape is, hold on. In a few minutes, you will have an incredible picture of what Camp Agape is and what God's doing through this ministry. Um, but we're just, we're so excited to have you, all of you Camp Agape families. We love having you here with us at Southlands. If you can turn and say hi to someone around you, introduce yourself to someone new, and kids, you are dismissed to head to kids' ministry. Good morning, Southlands. How we doing today? Yeah, go ahead, grab a seat. I'm JD, one of the pastors here, and it is so good to have you worshiping with us. If you are new uh, visitor, we just want to say welcome. We invite you to do what we call Stick Six, which is we think it takes more than one visit to decide if a church is a good fit for you. And so we just want to give you a warm welcome and invite back for another five weeks. And it's what we call Stick Six. And by that time, we think you'll have a good idea who we are. Uh, you can stop by the visitor center just through those doors after the service and grab a donut, cup of coffee, and we can tell you a little bit more about Southlands and how you can get involved. Um, we also just, uh, can I go ahead and have the ops team come forward? We're going to continue our worship with giving of our tithes and offering. And you can do that by dropping cash or a check in the basket or giving online or through our app. That information's on the screen behind me. This is a big week for us. Uh, we have Terry Virgo in town. Yeah, if you don't know who Terry is, he's a bit of a legend around here. Um, he's 80 years old, and he has followed and walked with Jesus for the long haul in planting churches and around the world. He's been a part of leading a movement called New Frontiers. 
Uh, we're part of Advance, which is kind of like a, a daughter movement of New Frontiers. And he's going to be in town on Friday night. So we want to invite you back 6.30 right here on Friday night. It was nine years ago that I was in this room for the very first time. And it was to hear uh, Terry come and share. And it was just a powerful night for me of just being ministered to. And so just want to say, man, we don't have a lot of fathers and even less grandfathers in the faith. And this is just a man to come and, and to learn from and just can model for us what it means to love Jesus for the long haul. So please come back Friday night. Then on Sunday morning next week, uh, Terry will be here preaching at the 830 service. And then after that, he's going to go serve another one of our advanced churches, Mercy Commons over in Fullerton. And so then at the 1030, we're going to have Dr. Corey from Biola. He's going to be here. So, man, it is a great doubleheader next Sunday. If I were you, I would just come to both services, get a donut in between. That's what I'll be doing. And so would invite you to do the same. All right. It's Camp Agape Recruitment Sunday. And we fired up. Camp Agape is an incredible partner and ministry that we get to participate with as a church. It's a ministry to um, children who have a parent who is incarcerated. One or both parents are incarcerated. I don't know if you know this, but there's around 300,000 children in California alone who have at least one parent in lockup. And if you look at statistics, 50% of those kids will follow suit unless that pattern and cycle's broken. And that's what Camp Agape is about. It's a weekend over Labor Day weekend coming up in September where we put on a camp and just bring these kids. You'll see some images on the screen as I talk. It is a ton of fun. And I wanna invite you, if you've never been a part of Camp Agape or served, this is the year for you. Sign up in the entryway after service. You can get more information. My family and I were a part of it last year for the first time. I'd been hearing about it for years, finally went last year. We had a blast. We're going back, my wife, kids, all of us cannot wait to go back and be a part of it again. But enough hearing from me. I want you to hear from some Camp Agape people. So I'm gonna welcome up Beth and her family and Ashley, you still here? Welcome Ashley back up. And we're gonna hear a little bit from some of the people who have benefited from camp. Come on up. Yeah, welcome them up. So it was after camp last year, uh, we often will have a baptism Sunday where we baptize students who have put their faith in Christ and just want to take that step. Come on up, Ashley. And that is when, come on. That is when I met um, Beth and her family. Her daughter Isabel was at camp and... Isabel, tell me about your favorite part about camp. Well, my favorite part about camp is going and experience a little bit more into Christianity and then also meeting kids that were also like me with the parent or both parents in a prison or locked up. And it's like you get more connection with more people that are in the same situation as you are. And it's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It was one of our favorite things to just be able to gather and baptize you after camp. And how has just being a part of this church community since that time just been for you? Um, it's been amazing. Um, I'm learning more and more about how I'm getting closer with Jesus and God. And it's just really awesome now. It's more better for me. That's awesome. Yeah, give it up for Isabella. And I met Beth on that Sunday, and we were just getting ready to start our engaged groups, our small groups ministry. And so I invited Beth, and she came and did a small group with John and Liz and I. And Beth, just tell us about uh, your experience of camp and this church. Well, having my husband incarcerated, it was hard. Um, we went through a lot. My husband was the one that helped us sight us up. He just got out a month ago. Come on. <laughs> At first, we didn't know, or we weren't going to church. Um, through camp, through Angel Tree, Camp Agape, reached out, and I was like, okay, kids, let's go. I was like, go be open-minded. It's something that I've never taken you guys to, but be open-minded, see where it takes you. Um, just see if you enjoy it. 
I was kind of concerned. I was like, oh no, this is something different for the kids. Um, they had online where we can watch the kids and see all the functions, which was really, really awesome. And then um, when I came to pick them up, I was like, oh God, are they gonna hate me for sending them? And then um, I came to pick up my son. He's actually in the children's ministry right now. And he, he was crying when he came out. I was like, oh no, he hated it. I'm such a bad mom. <laughs> Um, he came crying, and I was like, what's wrong? Are you hurt? Was it bad? And he's like, I just don't want to go. I just had so much fun. Um, they understood me. I got closer to God, and I really want to come back. Can I come back? Sure. And then when Liz called me saying they're going to do baptisms after the camp, and I was like, okay, we'll go to support. She's like, no pressure. I was like, okay. My daughter decided to get baptized, and we and we've been coming like... JD said, I joined the little group uh, things that they had. And like I said, it's been good because my husband just got out and now we're coming as a family and it's bringing us totally, completely as a family. And it's just awesome. So thank you, Camp Agape. Thanks, Beth. Albert, congratulations, man. We're, we're so proud of you. And just uh, Albert signed his family up while he was still in prison through Angel Tree, which is a partner ministry that helps give gifts to kids at Christmas time and, and gives dads an opportunity to be a part of that. And so Albert, we're just, we prayed for you. And for us, it's a huge celebration just to have you here today. Anything you wanna just share with us uh, just about camp or just ministry, any of your thoughts? It's just, I, I've seen, I can see the change in my kids. I can see the change in my wife. Like I said, it's just little, the little things that we take for granted. I kept my same prayer over and over and over. Just open her heart, give her a sign that you're there. He was working for me. He gave me the little signs, whether it was flyers all over her car. For her, it was nothing. To me, it was, oh, wow. My prayer was just answered. I was like, man, that's what really hit me. And I'm like, you know what? I can't do this no more. I can't afford this anymore. They're the ones suffering, not me. I'm suffering as well. But at the end, that cycle needs to be broken. If, it needs, if I need to take the first step and do it, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for me, and then I'm going to do it for them. So... Come on, praise God. Ashley uh, was MC at camp this year. She wore me out just by seeing how much energy she had for the whole weekend. It is a full-on weekend. Ashley, just tell us your heart for camp and how you got to be a part of it and, yeah, why you have so much energy. <laughs> All right, so aloha, my name is Ashley. I'm actually from the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, I actually attended camp as a student, like Isabel, um, maybe about 14, 15 years ago <laughs> now. Um, I actually was a student because my dad was incarcerated. He was in and out for most of my life, and I experienced the hurt, the neglect, um, the abuse that I saw in the household. I experienced it all. But through Camp Agape in this ministry, someone told me that I don't have to be defined by my father's mistakes, and I'm not. And through that, I met God, and I continuously come back because these kids need to know that they are not their parents' mistake. They are who God calls them to be. And that's why I continuously come back for students like Isabel, who just know the love of God, and we just see the generation come after and after and get stronger and stronger for God. Today, we actually invite, along with recruiting you to be a part of camp, uh, we've also invited a bunch of families that live in the area to just come be a part and check out us as a church. So if you're here as a family just visiting Southlands for the first time, we're so glad you're here. This is a church that loves you. This is a place that you can belong, and we'd love to just encourage your family. We're going to have lunch afterwards in and out, so those of you who aren't a part of that group, sorry you're missing out, uh, but we're going to have some fun later. Ashley, would you just pray over us in our service and for Al as he gets ready to preach? All right, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for being exactly who you say you are. We thank you that you are God of mercy and miracles and that you are God that breaks generational cycles, Father. I thank you for this day that we get to be in for all our students, Father God, that come through Camp Agape, all our volunteers and mentors, Father. We thank you for this service. We're about to be filled with the Spirit, Father, and we thank you for who you are in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can have a seat. So guys, as Al is coming up and they're grabbing their seat, just one last call. John will have the booth out there. You can go out, find out more information, 
Just a couple additional opportunities. If that Labor Day weekend, you're like, I already have plans or I can't go away for four days, a couple different ways you can get involved. On that Saturday, we'll have uh, an event here for parents while their kids are up the mountain. And so if you just wanted to serve Saturday morning, that's an opportunity. But also there's flyers out there that on July 17th, there's a banquet. And that's a way. Um, maybe you're not able to serve with your hands and feet, but you can give with your checkbook. And that's a great way to be a part of camp. So check out, grab one of those flyers. Thanks, J.D. try again. There we go. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when we were you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need for you. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. It's just so great to be preaching off the back of that powerful expression of the body empowered by the Spirit. It's just amazing to see what John and Liz and the team are doing and uh, how the Lord is strengthening the body and reconciling people to the body. And uh, it's an amazing picture, really, of our series, which we're calling Everyone Gets to Play. You know, I don't know if you have dreamed ever of being a superhero, uh, Spider-Man or Wonder Woman or whatever, you know, flying, cape flapping in the breeze, bashing through concrete walls to rescue uh, victims in distress. And I, I, I think, you know, that, that's a fun thing and we might dream of being a rock star or a sports hero, etc. But when we bring the superhero idea into the church, we get in trouble. Uh, because we expect one man or woman of power for the hour to stand up on the platform and dispense God's power and gifts and word and revelation. And it's like we're all drinking from one tap, one faucet, and expecting them 
to give us everything that we, we need. And actually, that's not what the Lord had in mind for His church. The Lord had in mind a body made up of many body parts that is empowered by the Spirit, full of gifts of the Spirit that enables the body to function and to grow. And that is what John Wimber, who founded the, the vineyard probably four decades ago, had in mind when he coined the phrase, everyone gets to play. He had in mind ordinary people doing extraordinary things through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he had in mind that actually the action wouldn't all happen up on the platform from behind the mic and behind the pulpit. We believe in called, gifted, qualified leaders. And it's not like open mic night here. It's not just anyone gets on the platform. But actually what God has in mind is that the action happens off the platform, all across the room, through to the lobby, through to the car park, through to the children's ministry, upstairs where the youth meet, and out into backyards and boardroom tables, across coffee shop tables, ordinary people doing the work of ministry in extraordinary ways. And that's why we had the scripture read from down there as kind of a dramatic, we're not gonna do that necessarily every week, but a dramatic picture of what God wants. He wants a multiplying of the saints equipped for works of ministry, amen? And Camp Agape is an amazing example of that. We probably have more volunteers in one weekend serving at that than any other weekend. But it's not just about Camp Agape. It's week in and week out. What does that look like? What does that look like? I'm gonna take Wimber's idea of everyone gets to play and uh, really preach it through the lens of 1 Corinthians uh, 12 if we can get the design up again. The idea is that there's no fans just sitting up in the bleachers watching the experts play down there. Uh, if you're a fan, you're just like, well, they're gonna do it and we'll cheer if they do well and jeer if they don't. But actually everyone off the bleachers, everyone off the bench and playing on the field. That's what God has in mind when He talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And I know for many of you, that's an uncomfortable thing. Even like, well, do they exist today? And if so, why? I'm gonna try and answer some of the questions. We've got about three weeks for this series. Uh, but I really trust that in the words of Ted Lasso, taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse. If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. I, I, this is a bit of a John Wimber, Ted Lasso mashup right now. Um, but, but I wanna try and play coach and encourager and help you to get over your fear of discomfort because the gifts of the Spirit do have a discomfort factor. But if a, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth embracing uh, the discomfort. And, and my hope is, is that over the next three weeks that we see some action on the stage for sure, but actually the action happens amongst you in this, across the room, out into the lobby and out into the world. You, you up for it? You up for it? The front row's up for it. How about the back row? Yeah? You guys have to be up for it. You're paid to be up for it. I wanna say, um, first up what we see from this passage, beautiful passage, confusing passage, but, but rich, and we're gonna hang out here, is if we're talking about everyone gets to play and, 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 and the big game plan of the gifts of the Spirit, what are they for? They are ultimately for making Jesus the superhero. The gifts of the Spirit are not trophies to display on a cabinet. They're not like a Superman badge. Oh, that guy's so gifted. That woman's so gifted. I wanna say like in the church, we get so impressed by gifted people. They're so gifted. I wanna say God is not impressed by your gifting because He gave you your gifting. And we should be less impressed about it and realize that the gifts of the Spirit are ultimately to make Jesus the hero. And to be totally honest, the Corinthian church that the Apostle Paul was writing to, it was an absolute dumpster fire. It was a dysfunctional church. They were powerful in the gifts of the Spirit, but they were actually very carnal. They weren't spiritual. 
And that's why Paul begins by saying, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. And actually that word spiritual gift is more than spiritual gift, it's actually spirituality. He was like, about being spiritual, I don't want you to be uninformed. It's not just about praying in tongues. It's not just about laying your hands on the sick. It's much more than that. And he carries on to say, no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed and no one says Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. In other words, the reason for the the spiritual gifts is so that people say Jesus is Lord. It's to make Jesus the hero. It's not, not to make a hero of anyone else. And what had happened in this Corinthian church, I mean, they were so dysfunctional. People were getting drunk at the communion table. One guy was sleeping with his mother-in-law. People were suing each other. There were factions and divisions around their favorite superhero preacher. And Paul had to say, hey, don't make a superhero out of me. Don't make a superhero out of Apollos or Peter. Make a superhero out of Jesus. He's the only one safe to make a hero out of. And I would just say again, please let's be careful that both in here and outside, we, we don't make a hero of so-called powerful people. I don't know who your favorite preacher is, whether it's T.D. Jakes or Tim Keller or Christine Kane. I don't know who it is. Great people, celebrate those people. John Mark Comer, Francis Chan. I don't know who it is, but don't make a hero of those people just because they're gifted. The reason that the Spirit comes is so that we make Jesus Lord. And he goes on in verse two, he says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. In other words, when you didn't have the Spirit of God, you made idols out of created things. You worship them. But he says, now that you have the Spirit of God, you won't do that. You won't be led astray to make an idol out of a created thing, whether that idol is a superhero preacher or otherwise superhero rock star or otherwise even a car or a job or a person you love. You won't make an idol out of them. They won't be number one in your life. Jesus will. And I just wanna say that is the aim, the ultimate aim for the spiritual gifts, that that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus gets to call the shots in our life. And that happens with the spiritual gifts. I mean, it's great, it's fun, it's surprising, it's exciting, but sometimes it's real challenging because Jesus comes and He says, hey, that thing has become your idol. That thing has become your cause and your Lord and I wanna be Lord. I've been working with uh, a church not too far from here and there's been a lot of kind of messy stuff happened and some decisions that have made people really angry in the church and so, hundreds of people have left and they're so angry that they've actually sued the church. And I just wanna say, oh man, it's, it's been horrible, it's been messy and the people that have left, they've, they've, they've got a reason in some ways, but it's been so sad and I've been pleading with them, actually writing letters to them, try and get together and say, don't be like the Corinthians, you know, get a wise judge in and someone to mediate, etc. And But these guys were just like, no, we're gonna see justice, you know? And I just wanna say, man, a lawsuit in a church, no one wins except the lawyers. Trust me. And uh, so I'm pleading and, and, and it's not happening. <laughs> and then the one guy who's like a real leader in the lawsuit, he has a dream. And in the dream, he's fighting with his next door neighbor over a dog that's gone rabid. And he is planning to kill the dog. And it's just going really bad because the dog has got rabid. And in it, in this dream, God says to him, you mind your own business and let me take care of mine. And he wakes up and he's like, this is not about my neighbor. This is about the lawsuit. And he calls his buddies and he says, guys, I'm out of the lawsuit. I'm minding my own business. Jesus must be Lord here, not me. And he calls me, he says, hey, God has spoken. I'm I'm out of the lawsuit. I'm just like, oh, that's why the spiritual gifts are powerful because actually suddenly a guy goes, Jesus is Lord, amen? And he actually does something that he doesn't want, but actually allows Jesus to be Lord. So that is, is firstly, that's, that's the aim of the spiritual gift. The second thing we see, and so man, whether we prophesy or whether we pray and see someone get healed or have a word of knowledge, it's all good stuff, but let's, let's be like about team Jesus winning, amen? Let's, let's, let's not be about my team 
or I mean, I mean remember me, this is, this is my thing. You know when someone scores a goal in soccer and sometimes like they run to the crowd and they go like this, oh, my name, remember my name. And you just go like, oh man, this guy's got an ego trip, you know? We're a little bit like that in, in, in church. But actually the best is when someone scores a goal and they grab the, the team badge and they go like this, remember the team. And I'm just saying like, can we be like that? Can we be less focused on our name on the back of the shirt and much more focused on Jesus' name, amen? I think a church that does that enjoys long, long outpourings of the Spirit because no one needs to get the credit. And then secondly, the big idea here is that Jesus wants everybody to learn to use the gifts of the Spirit for the common good. He says, verse four, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. Varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Can you say all? In everyone. And then he says, and to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Say to each one. I'm saying that because I want to try and debunk the idea that the gifts of the Spirit that are listed here, gifts of healing and faith and miracles and prophecy, distinguishing of spirits to another various kinds of tongues. In, in two weeks time, we'll di dive more into what they are and how they work. But for now, I just want you to see that to each one, like there's no one that qualified to get the gifts of the Spirit because they were super good. To each one. You remember Jesus when he stands up in John 7 and, and, and he cries out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come drink of me. And if you believe in me, rivers of living water will spring up to eternal life. And John says, and he was talking about the Holy Spirit who would be poured out. And the apostle Paul pings off that same John 7 and he says, we were all given one spirit to drink. He's wanting us to remember the words of Jesus. In other words, what qualifies you and I to drink from the Spirit? What is it? Shout it out. Belief in Jesus. That's all. The only thing that qualifies you to drink of the Spirit is belief in Jesus. If anyone believes in me, Jesus doesn't say if anyone behaves and doesn't do anything wrong, you'll drink of me. If anyone believes, say believes. So what qualifies you not just to drink of the Spirit, but now to dispense the water of the Spirit to other thirsty people through the gifts of the Spirit? What is it? Belief. Same thing that saved you is the thing that qualifies you to dispense the water of the Spirit. So please stop disqualifying yourself. You might have been saved for a week. You might be struggling with some repetitive sin. It does not disqualify you in, a, in actual fact the more you take your eyes off yourself and go, Holy Spirit, I drink of you and now I wanna share with others who are thirsty, actually the more you break out of cycles of sin because you're no longer fixated with your own issues. To each one is given. And then it says, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I, I, I love that, that manifestation. The manifestation of the Spirit essentially is just that the Spirit and His presence and power is given to take an invisible God and reveal Him in visible ways. It's to take the intangible reality of God and manifest Him in tangible, visible ways. Now you say, oh, we don't need that. You know, we've, we've got the Bible and we walk not by sight, but, but by faith. And that's true. But the same Spirit that inspired the Bible, which is perfect, also gives gifts to His people to sustain and build them. And we weigh them under the perfect Bible. Some people say, well, you know, the Bible is, is finished, it's the canon, it's complete. And once the perfect comes, the imperfect things like the gifts pass away. But this same 
Apostle Paul says this to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7, he says, you are not lacking any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you until the end. Hear me out here. You are not lacking any spiritual gift while you wait for the appearing of Jesus who will sustain you to the end. In other words, the spiritual gifts, even though we have the perfection of Scripture, we don't have the perfection of the church yet. And the church is still being perfected and being sustained and will be until Christ comes. And Paul says, you will not lack any spiritual gift until the appearing of Jesus. In other words, the spiritual gifts are not an optional extra that the church needed while the canon of Scripture was being established. It's actually still needed now, even with the, the perf perfection of Scripture. So all of you get something. And it's a visible sign of the invisible God. You know, we were in the UK recently and we were in a meeting and we were praying for healing and there was a word of knowledge. That's what it says here, a word of knowledge, which is kind of information you would have about a person that you didn't have any actual knowledge about. So the Spirit just gives you like something dropped into someone's heart who was praying there and says, I believe that there's someone here with like really bad back pain. And I'm a little bit like, oh my gosh, well, that's like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, it was like a lot of people there, quite old people, quite a lot of elderly people. Like as you get to 50, like who doesn't have back pain? You know what I'm saying? So I'm being a little bit like cynical. And anyway, few people come up, this one lady comes up and they pray for her. Two days later, she gets up and she says, what you didn't know is I had a terrible car accident and I uh, had a bad operation and the pain has just got worse and worse and worse. And she said, as you prayed for me, I felt the, the pain start to subside. It's like, that is amazing. And then she said, the next day I looked in the mirror and I had a huge, big, long scar down my back and it started to disappear. You just go, what? What is that? She's like, it's half gone and my back pain is gone. Well, what do you do with that? It's the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And that doesn't necessarily happen every time we pray, but I'm just so glad for that person that got up and said, I have a word of knowledge and we were willing to pray and God did an amazing thing. The invisible God made manifest visibly for the common good. And then this word common good, for the common good. I think very often, you who have sat in church and heard about the spiritual gifts, you immediately think kind of, well, what's my ministry? Like, what's my thing? You almost think of it like a personality thing. It's like, what's my thing? What's my Enneagram number? What's my gift number? And I just want you to like, just chill out with that stuff, please. Chill out. Because at the end of this passage, it does say, and God appoints apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, administrators working with, there does seem to be a calling that is more of a lifelong calling but actually the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good is not the same as that. That is a momentary gift that you might get one off that you never get again. Why? Just because someone needs it. Let me give you an example. My friend Mike Duggins is an outstanding administrator. So whatever he does, he administrates it just amazingly, right? So he's speaking to me yesterday. He's like, okay, the spiritual gift of administration, that's great. Talk about that because I'm called to that. I'm like, absolutely, Mike. But do you realize that while you administrate, which is your long time calling, you can ask God for the spiritual gift of prophecy. It's not like, well, I'm the administrator, so someone else freaky can prophesy. It's like, what if administrators did it more prophetically? Or I can say, man, I have a calling to teach the Word of God. What if I did it asking the Holy Spirit for more discernment of spirits, to be able to read the room for a stronger gift of faith? It's not my calling, but in the moment, it actually empowers the calling. It's almost like, let's say God is like the plumber and you are the apprentice. And you're just the kippy, the apprentice with no tools yourself. And, and so you're there and you've got to fix a toilet and you just say, hey, Mr. Plumber, would you mind if I reach in 
and grab a wrench because that's what is needed for the common good right now. And the plumber says, yeah, go, here we go, there we go. It's not yours, you have to give it back. But actually in that moment for the common good, you needed a wrench and you got it. And so actually all of the people of God can access all of the gifts by faith for a moment. They're not necessarily possessive for all time. And I think when that happens, we go, okay, I'm trying to figure out my calling, but Lord, even when I figure out my calling, I'm still gonna need to reach into the box of tools. The spiritual gifts are tools for a task. So Julia, who we prayed for, has a calling to go and teach kids the gospel in Japan as she plants a church with others. That's a calling. I mean, she has been preparing for that for years. And we set her apart. God's appointed her to do that. But Julia, as you go, I'm trusting that you would go, God, won't you give me a gift of faith for miracles? Because that's gonna help my calling hugely. So can we just see there's a connection between what my calling is and what actually empowering is? You can access all of those gifts if it's for the common good. And you don't have to be an expert at them. You can have your learner plates on. In fact, we all have our learner plates on. And having your learner plates on doesn't make you a loser. I think one of the kind of cautions with the spiritual gifts is that we've been disappointed. And so someone's prophesied over us and that thing hasn't come to pass. Or someone's prayed for us or we've prayed for someone else and they haven't got healed. And you're like, well, that didn't work. So I'm just never gonna do that again. And I just wanna say, that's kind of weird. I have empathy because I, I live with some unanswered prayers and some disappointment, etc. But it's kind of weird that we would expect it to be absolutely 100%, otherwise we're not doing it. I wanna ask you, did Paul, the apostle, have the gift of healing? Trick question, did he? Did he? I mean, I would say yes and no, because certainly people got healed. I mean, they even got raised from the dead under Paul. Paul never called himself Paul the healer. He called himself Paul the apostle. That was his calling. That's what he was appointed to do. But he saw healing, but not 100%. I mean, there was this one time when he preached so long and so boring that a guy sitting in the window, a young boy, fell out the window and fell down and died. I might have preached over time a little bit, but no one's, no one's died yet. It's good. And I can imagine at that point, Paul was like, whether I'm an apostle or not, Mr. Plummer, I'm reaching out by faith for a gift of miracles because this guy's dead and I, don't, I wanna be invited back to preach. And he prays and God raised him from the dead. But there was a number of occasions where Paul, both in his own life and in other people's lives, prayed and people didn't get healed. In fact, he says, I left Trophimus in Miletus because he was sick. What do you do with that? I bet you Paul prayed. He prayed about himself. Lord, let this thorn in the flesh be taken from me. Most people say it was his eyesight. Didn't happen. He says to Timothy, his promising apprentice, hey buddy, stop drinking water and take some wine for your stomach. I'm not about to get into alcohol and all that stuff, but I'm just saying he told him to take some wine for his stomach. That was ointment in those days. Don't you come to me and say, Alan said I must take wine as ointment. (laughs) But actually, I mean, you don't think he prayed for Timothy? But that didn't stop Paul from reaching out by faith into the the toolbox and say, this is not 100%. In other words, Paul didn't possess the gift. He just switches it on. Every time you reach out by faith and we don't live in a 100% world, but I've never heard an evangelist stand up and say, you know what? I stood up and preached the gospel and only three people got saved. I'm never preaching the gospel again because it's only 100%. No, it's not 100%. They never do that. It's just like every person that gets saved, that's awesome. Well, what about prophecy? What about healing? What about tongues and interpretation? It doesn't have to be 100%. That's why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, don't despise prophecy. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Test everything. We test everything in the Word of God. It's not 100%. 
I, I live with mystery. You live with mystery. I remember probably 10 years ago, praying right there for a, a young 10-year-old girl called Taylor. And she had leukemia. They'd done everything. The doctors sent her home to die. And her parents came. And we prayed for her. And then the couple moved state. But I heard a couple years later, she's healed. God healed her. It was amazing. And every few years, they will send back a photo. Now Taylor's 21. This is Taylor graduating. This is Taylor at her 21st. I'm just like, Jesus, you healed cancer. It's amazing. But we've also prayed for other people who had cancer and they didn't get healed and they died. And they're people that we really loved. And so I get it. God gets it. It can rock us onto the back foot. But we're in good company with the Apostle Paul who didn't see everyone healed. So we live with mystery. We live with a sense of there is suffering in this world, but we're not going to stop trusting for the Spirit of God to break through into this world, push back darkness, and bring the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. But we live with unanswered prayer, delayed prayer, and sometimes God sovereignly choosing not to heal. That's okay. That's okay. So we ask by faith, what is needed for the common good? What is needed for the common good? And then if nothing amazing happens, you know what? No one died and people get loved in the process. I wanna say when you bring a word of encouragement or a prophetic word, or a word of knowledge, or you pray and someone doesn't get healed. Even if that word, I spoke to a guy after 8.30 this morning, good guy, guys, a guy called Brent, football coach. And he said, I had a word of knowledge about someone who was blind in their left eye. It was a student at Biola. And I was like, yeah. this guy comes up, he says, it's me, blind in my left eye, never met him before. It's like, yes, God, you spoke, so I pray. And nothing happens. And we look at each other. And he looks at me only through one eye and he can't see through the other. And I felt so bad that I'd got his hopes up. It was terrible. And then he said, but you know what the guy said? I felt really loved in the process and I felt seen. I wanna say, that's good. And maybe God does heal him in time, but actually don't let disappointment hold you back. So I'm gonna land with team culture. If everyone gets to play, what's the culture of this team? How do we do this thing in a healthy way? Healthy way. Uh, three things. First, let's have eager desire. Let's have eager desire for the gift of the Spirit. That's what the Apostle Paul says, verse 31 of this passage, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Some of you have been taught that the more excellent way is love. So we started with the gifts and then we move on to love. And I wanna say that's bad biblical exegesis. Paul actually says in this chapter, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts and pursue love. And the excellent way is not moving from gifts to love, it's moving from gifts without love to gifts with love. Paul never said they should, they should stop the gifts. This was an unloving, gifted church. And he was saying the more excellent way is to be a loving, gifted church. You tracking with me? Don't let people say, oh, there's, there's a more excellent way. He never said that. He actually said, until Christ returns, you lack no unspiritual gift. And so we eagerly desire. Some of you have been taught, well, okay, I mean, there's kind of a freak show out there. So just be like cautiously open to the gifts because we don't want to get into the freak show, do we? And I just want to say that's not biblical. I understand if you've seen the freak show and you've been disappointed and you've been hurt and you're cautious, that's absolutely fine. But to say, well, I'm a charismatic, but with a seatbelt on, so I'm never going to step out. No, what does eager desire mean? Eager desire means I'm on the front foot. I'm, I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm stepping out of the boat like Peter. I'm not sitting in the boat. Imagine if you applied that to love. You know, it says, eagerly desire the gift and pursue love. Imagine if Ronell came and said like, 
hey, do you love me? And I was like, yeah, but with the seatbelt on. You know, I'm cautiously open to loving you. Like, that's just an insult. If you're married, it is. I mean, some of you should be cautiously open with a seatbelt on. <laughs> I'm looking right here. But where it comes to, e to, to the gifts, the Bible says, no, 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 don't, don't have a seatbelt on. And if you're gonna have a seatbelt, let it be love. Not be conservatism. No, eagerly desire, but living with, with mystery. Live with the mystery that it's not 100% that we live between the resurrection of Christ and the return of Christ, and there will always be sickness, and there will be sadness, and there will be death until Christ comes. So live with that mystery, but actually trust that the kingdom comes. Secondly, freedom with discernment. And by this, I mean we do not chase charismatic phenomena. And we do not chase emotionalism, but neither do we resist it. We've got different cultures here and different church backgrounds. I grew up in Africa. And in Africa, I mean, if someone dies, you cry loudly for days. That's just respectful. And if someone gets married, you ululate with joy. La, 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 la. And if you don't, it's disrespectful. Now, I realize there are other cultures that are much more like, no, no, just keep it calm, you know? The Brits, keep calm and carry on, you know? Or the Germans or whatever, you know? And then we are very cynical towards any outward display of emotion or even more cynical about anyone who, who, who cries or shakes or falls down. And we're just like, well, that can't be God. And I just wanna say, it doesn't have to be God, but it can. In fact, if you look through Scripture at when people encountered God, there was emotion and there was manifestation. I mean, for heaven's sake, where the Spirit of God was poured out at Pentecost, the people, the city thought they were drunk. In other words, they were rowdy. They were raucous. They were courageous, liquid courage. And Peter had to say, hey, these people aren't drunk. They're just filled with the Spirit. We don't chase after that stuff. But neither are we resistant to it. Please, if you like the moment someone laughs as they fill with the Spirit, or the moment they cry or shake, you just go, oh, I'm so freaked out by that. I just want to ask why. Is it your culture or is it the Bible? Because the Bible is not freaked out by that. The Bible actually just says, just weigh it. Weigh it with the Word of God. Don't put out the Spirit's fire, but hold fast to what is good and reject what is evil. That doesn't mean that anyone who is manifesting in that way is spiritual. It doesn't. I mean, look at the Corinthians. We have some people that when the Spirit comes on them, like you can see it on their body, like they start to shake and shiver. Mandy looks like she's been punched in the solar plexus. She kind of goes, Ugh, like this. And the first time she did it, it was like, Mandy, can I get you a glass of water for those hiccups, you know? What is that? And she's like, no, 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 that's just what happens when the Spirit comes. Let's never copy her, but let's also not be freaked out by that. It's okay. If you look at people encountering the living God through the Scriptures, they did all manner of things. Shake, fall to their knees, fall flat on the, on the floor. So we don't chase that stuff, but we, neither do we resist it. I can already feel some of you getting freaked out. And I just, I just wanna say, like, we've got grace in the ch this church for you to kind of wade in slowly and grace for you to ask questions. I know some of us have, have seen some stuff where it gets out of control. And I just wanna say, I think we are about a thousand miles from there. We really are. Some of you need to travel with me and go, <laughs> I'll show you out of control. <laughs> And you come back to California, it's just so chilled, man. Just so chilled. And I just want to say, there's a little bit more, even though we don't chase it. Do you believe me? <laughs> oh, gosh. Finally, let's be supernatural, but natural. 
So we're going to practice now praying for one another. It's not going to be the elders at the front. It's not going to be the prayer team on the side. We're for that. But for now, it's like everyone gets to play. So, so Joel's actually going to lead us through that. But I want to give you some really practical hints as we do that. Firstly, when you pray for someone, don't pray too long. And, and don't use words or a tone of voice. Like if you have to change the tone of voice, oh Lord, I just pray yeah, that this person, like, like, that, like God can't do anything powerful with you saying, Jesus, uh. I'm just like, uh, I know there's some powerful people that say that, but just you be you. And it'll actually be much better for people to go, oh, this person hasn't lost their ever loving mind. I encourage you to keep your eyes open when you pray. You know, God doesn't hear you more if you close your eyes. It helps you to concentrate, but actually, when you pray for a person, ask them, can I pray for you? Secondly, ask them, do you mind if I put my hand on your shoulder? And if they say no and feel free to say no, just respect their space. God, can, We believe in laying on of hands, but God can meet them without laying on of hands. Do you believe it? He really can. And so respect that. I find it easier to pray laying on of hands because I understand like I've drunk from the Spirit and now I'm like a conduit. People are drinking from the Spirit, but actually somehow God is working through me, communicating His presence. I don't know how, but that's why laying on of hands happens in Scripture. But then keep your eyes open and actually watch. Don't feel like you have to fill the space with a long best prayer. I pray short prayers with long interjections of silence where you just wait and you watch. And sometimes a person gets goosebumps and you can see it. And sometimes their eyelids start to flip, flicker, flutter, and, and you can see it. Sometimes they start to weep or, or laugh. Other times they start to kind of sway like a weeping willow. Please never push them. But actually like that stuff happens. And also sometimes there's zero visible on the outside, but even when you, I don't see it, you're working. I mean, often God is working invisibly, amen? But don't be closed to visible manifestations. And sometimes, you know, something will happen in a person and actually there will be a clash between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan and, and there will be some, something violent happening. Keep your eyes open. I've been punched before with my eyes closed. Now, now I've freaked you out. <laughs> but, but, but keep your eyes open because when the Spirit of God comes, I mean, come on, have you ever watched a lion? Have you ever seen a lion in a safari park? You're just like, oh my gosh. I mean, to see a lion and you're just like, well, well don't do anything on the outside. Don't, don't laugh, don't cry, don't do anything. No, I mean, when you see something majestic, something in your body and your emotions does something, how much more the living God? And so keep your eyes open and then stop for a moment and say, hey, how are you doing? And if you've been prayed for and you're just like, I'm feeling nothing, say it, it's okay. But if you're going like, yeah, yeah, I'm feeling this. Can you pray into this? Or otherwise say, that really made sense what you prayed, but that picture that you brought, can you explain it a little bit more? Because you might bring a verse or you might bring a word or there might be a picture that, that pops into your head and the person isn't getting it. So stop, ask, how are you doing? Have a little interview. Holy Spirit doesn't leave the room. He's fine with that. And then you get back to praying. Have a conversation together. Supernaturally natural. All right, Joel, won't you come up? Won't you stand with me? I'm not gonna do a big kind of conclusion with an altar call because we wanna play. So won't you just posture yourself if it helps you, palms open. You don't have to do this, but this is one way that I posture myself just going, Holy Spirit, I, I need you. I, I need to receive you. And just think of this promise. You all have one spirit to drink. But each one of you are also dispensers of the spirit. Different shapes, different colors, different sizes. And so Holy Spirit, we thank you for Jesus who said, if you believe in me, if you're thirsty, rivers of living water will come. 
And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and pour yourself out with gifts. Not just gifts for us, but we want to be water dispensers of life. Gifts for others. Give us courage, like Peter, to get out of the boat, to walk across the room. Lord, we thank you that there is room for, to play. And we pray that you would refresh every person here. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to respond. Um, and as Alan said, we're going we're gonna to play. We're going to practice. Uh, and we're actually going to respond in a way that, that we don't normally uh, respond kind of corporately in this way. We, we're going to take communion. But in a moment when we do, I actually want to encourage you and kind of walk us through just what this will look like and how we want to take communion today. And I really want to encourage you to take communion with somebody else. If you take it with your spouse, um, if you take it with your, uh, your family kind of every week, I just want to say this morning, can you actually have eyes to just look around and say, God, who, who do you want me to take communion with? this morning. At the end of the 8.30, I looked around and just kind of glanced around the room and said, okay, God, who do you want me to take communion with? And a good friend of mine was on the side. I just walked over and said, hey, can I take communion with you? Unbeknownst to me, they're like, I'm having like a massive anxiety attack. And I said, okay, like, well, let's, let's, let's pray through that. Let's pray for that. But I just want you to look around and just see people, see someone and just say, God, who do you want me to take communion with? I want you just to find somebody. And I want to encourage you, you don't have to have like some profound word of knowledge. Part of this is just stepping out and saying, God, I, want to, I just want to trust that you're going, to, you're going to speak or I'm just going to encourage them and pray for them and they're going to feel loved in the process. One of the most encouraging things that I think I see in scripture is that oftentimes when God moves and there's these mirac miraculous moments in, in scripture, it actually starts by someone risking. You think about Luke 5, these, these men carry their friend to Jesus. And they can't get into the house, but like, we got to get him in there. So they take what I imagine is quite a risk and they start tearing through the roof of someone else's house. And they don't actually know at that point, is this guy going to be healed? But they're, they're willing to risk. Peter's in the boat and Jesus says, hey, come in and, and step out of the boat and walk on, on the water. And he actually has to take a step and get out of the boat. And this morning we're going to do that. We're going to take a little bit of a step and we're going to step out of the boat and we're going to take communion with someone else. And as you do, there's a couple helpful points uh, that we had in the first service that we can throw back up of just how to, how to practice this. And so I think as you take communion, as you find someone to take it with, would you just take a, 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 a moment, 30 seconds, just, and just ask God, okay, God, what do you have for this person? Or maybe ask them, hey, is there, is there anything in particular that, that, that you could use prayer for? Let them share and listen. Listen to what they say and say, okay, I'm gonna pray for that and, and then pray for them. And then as Alan said, have a little bit of a conversation and actually say, did that land with you? And we're going to practice this morning, all right? And some of you feel super comfortable with this, and some of you feel absolutely freaked out by that. And that's okay, regardless of which camp you're in, it's okay. So we're going to take communion, and we're going to worship, and we're going we're gonna to practice. Um, so kind of as you're ready, just there's tables in the front here, there's tables on the side. I just want to encourage you, go and take communion. If you have not placed your faith in Jesus, I just want to take a moment to hide this. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus, the communion table is actually for those of us who have said, hey, Jesus is Lord, he's Savior. I believe in the, his death on the cross, his body broken for me, his blood poured out for me. But can I encourage you, if you've not chosen to follow Jesus at this point, would you be so bold as still to join a group? Be a part of what God's doing. And, and maybe this morning, actually, God wants to break in and, and reveal a little bit more of himself to you this morning as well. So please feel free to jump into a group and join a group, even if you're not taking communion. But let's go to the table, take communion, pray for one another, and trust that God wants to, to move this morning as we, uh, as we practice and everyone gets to play.
If you are still praying, please, please do not feel rushed. Continue to pray. Um, continue to meet with Jesus. We are, are grateful for that. I kind of want to do two things. One, I just want to say that if you need to go, we are at the end of service and you are, are free to go. Um, but as we do, I wanted to share a word that I think may resonate with, with one or a couple of you in this room. Um, we had a word from Antoine, who's a member here. At the end of the first service, he came to me and said, hey, I just really feel like God gave me this picture. And I feel like it may connect with someone this morning. And so I think one of the beautiful things about a Sunday like this is that God's doing all sorts of stuff in this room. And there's some people who are, are everyone's playing, right? And but yet there's still maybe a word that might connect uh, to a couple of you specifically. And so we had just this picture of an individual who actually had a house or kind of a, it felt like a temple. It was full of a bunch of different little religious artifacts and idols. And this person had kind of been uh, seemingly tasting the different idols. And Jesus was one of those idols in their life, one of the idols in their house, but he actually wasn't the primary one. And he had this sense that this morning that there would be someone here who actually Jesus this morning wanted to say, no, no, you've been tasting and sampling, but I want you to know today that I'm the true God. And in this image, this little idol of Jesus kind of manifested and became big and the others faded away. And so I just want to say, if that is you this morning and you've sat through this message and you're sitting here going, okay, I'm here about the, the manifestation of the spirit of God, but I've actually been looking to other idols. I would just love to connect with you. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you. And I'll hang around in the front. If that's you, please come talk to me. I would love to connect and, and pray for you. Other than that, please, please, please have an incredible Sunday morning. And can I encourage you as you go, carry this on into the lobby, into your workplaces, into your homes. And will you report back to us? Will you come and share next Sunday and say, hey, here's what God did this week. We're trusting that he'll do much in these few weeks of this series as we press into what he's doing for each of us. Incredible to worship with you, Southlands. Feel free to go grab your kids if they're in kids ministry. If you're praying, carry on. There is no rush.